know it's no pain, no gain Go hard till the end What's the use of playing a game If you ain't aiming to win my feet So just a little bit about Access Silicon Valley. I'll just take two minutes. Before I uh, became a lawyer, I, I was an entrepreneur for 10 years, kind of made all the mistakes in the book. And um, you know, so I, now I just tell my clients, uh, don't do what I did or do what I didn't do and you'll be fine. I, I really had the, uh, the school of hard knocks. But one thing that I realized, I was out in Texas, that I just didn't have access to the kind of incredible content that we have access to in Silicon Valley. And I think so often we just take this for granted that you can come to an event like this tonight and there's probably two or three other incredible events going on. But if you're out in you know, Dallas or Duluth or uh, in Amsterdam, you may not have access to this kind of content. And so as part of my giving back, I really felt that um, I'd like to give as many people access to this incredible content that we take for granted here. So the way it started, and a lot of, uh, a lot of folks here became members of Access Silicon Valley a couple of years ago. If you remember, in our conference room at our office in Menlo, it's a conference room for 22. We would squeeze 60 into the room. That's how we kind of started. And I just said, you know what? Let's flip on the video cam uh, conference camera, let people come to the San Diego office, and they can get access to this. And that's how Access Silicon Valley was born. We now have about uh, 35 cities from Tel Aviv to Dublin, London, Dallas, LA, New York, uh, and we've got the most incredible engaged entrepreneurs that, that are engaged with uh, Access Silicon Valley tuning in tonight. More likely they'll be in Europe at least tuning in tomorrow and not doing it live since they don't want to get up at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. So uh, I just want to say thank you to all our incredible volunteers who worked so hard tonight. Shannon Donnellan who put this uh, event together and made it look so easy. Uh, so thank you, and a big round of uh, applause for you guys. Thank you. So as you know, tonight we're going to, uh, in terms of the format, we're going to put a few questions to Scott on the stage. We're then going to turn it over to the live audience, the virtual audience. Really want to make this as interactive as possible. Just a couple of points on the questions. Please try and keep them general. I'm sure that there are a lot of people that have very, very specific questions that are specific to their business. But let's just try and keep it general so that we have questions that are of greatest applicability to, uh, to everybody in the, uh, in the audience. So before I invite Scott up to the stage, I'm just going to say a couple of words about uh, Scott and his background. Very, very modest guy, so he's not going to toot his own horn, so we will have to do it for him. Um, he joined Andreessen in 2009 and serves as the uh, Chief Operating Officer, Partner, and Managing Director. Uh, through these all-encompassing positions, He's able to engage with and impact every facet of the uh, and recent Horowitz business. Not only is Scott a highly experienced VC and entrepreneur in both consumer and SaaS uh, companies, he serves as an executive in residence at the Haas School of Business, co-teaching the Spring Entrepreneurship Class, serves as a director of the uh, NVCA, National Capital Venture Association, uh, and SnapLogic. Previously, Scott served as the VP and GM of International Operations at Opsware and started the Opsware Asia Pacific Operations via strategic partnerships with NEC, NTT, and Samsung. He joined HP in 2007 uh, through the uh, $1.6 billion acquisition of Opsware and as VP and, GAP, uh, and GM of software uh, as a service at HP. Uh, he had global responsibility for all facets of customer interaction, including professional services, technical pre-sales, and customer support. So he's also represented customers in uh, companies in both financing and mergers and acquisitions. He was at Credit Suisse First Boston and at Lehman, if, uh, if uh, one can still remember Lehman. Uh, so without further ado, please uh, welcome me, uh, help me welcoming Scott up onto the stage. Scott, come on up. Thanks. So just one thing that, that many people don't know. Come on, so okay, take a seat. Thank you. Um, who knows what Andreessen goes by? What's their website? I'm sure you guys have never looked at Andreessen. But if you did, 
what, what, what's their website? Right. What is that? Who knows what that is? Yeah, for those of you that Somebody's don't it, right? know, yeah. Right, yeah. it's um, a numeronym, which is the first letter Andreessen, of Andreessen, last letter of Horowitz, Z, and the number of characters uh, between them. Who came up with that? Uh, well, so it's, it's funny. So for anybody who comes from the software world, right, you would re remember things like localization and internationalization, which go by the same monikers, right? So localization has always been called L10N and internationalization I18N. And I don't really know what the history of those are, to be honest. So when we started the firm, uh, we realized that nobody would actually be able to find our URL if we called it Andreessen Horowitz. So uh, it was kind of a tip to our old software days and a convenience of making sure people could actually find our website. Interesting. No more complicated than that. Excellent. So, uh, as I mentioned, Scott, Scott's a lawyer. Take us back, Scott. How, how did you get to Andreessen Horowitz? So you, uh, you got to law school, Stanford Law School. Uh, you avoided the golden handcuffs of big law, um, which often is very tough to, uh, tough to do. Yeah. And uh, you ended up at Opsware, sold to HP, and, and now manage a partner. How, how, how did this all happen? Yeah, so I'll spare you the details, but I think it's a lot of luck and happenstance, to be completely honest. So I went to law school thinking I actually wanted to be a lawyer, uh, not knowing, of course, what lawyers did. And uh, <laughs> unfortunately for me, as I learned more about it, I realized my interest in being a lawyer kept declining. So, you know, no, no offense to any lawyers out there, but for me personally, it just wasn't, uh, wasn't the right thing. And so what I ended up doing was I just spent a bunch of money on law school and realized I didn't want to do that job. So uh, I decided to go into banking, and I went, as you mentioned, to Lehman Brothers. Um, and so I figured that was cheaper than actually going to business school and paying to go try to get a business degree after having spent a lot of money at Stanford Law School already. Um, and uh, what happened was my timing was just good there. So I was in the banking industry at the beginning of what turned out to be the bubble, right? So I started in 97 and was there till a little after 2000. So every investment bank, if you could basically, uh, you know, kind of have a heartbeat and sit at a printer, which I don't know if even we do printers these days anymore, but you know, the printer, if a company's going public, it used to be as a junior banker, it used to literally sit at the printer for 24 hours a day for as long as it took to actually file the prospectus, you know, file the, the state, the, uh, you know, the documents for an IPO. And you had this glorious job of literally, you know, writing this stuff and then editing it and making sure that, you know, the dot, you know, dots were, I's were dotted and the T's were crossed. So, um, you know, I kind of got, that's how I got involved in the technology space originally. And then what happened was a company of mine, Epiphany, went public. And for anybody who was yep. here at that time, you'll remember Epiphany, which was this new CRM company. Um, and the day it went public, uh, a guy who was running marketing there left to join this company called LoudCloud. Uh, this was September of 99. So Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz and um, actually two other co-founders, Insic Re and Tim Howes, founded this company. And this guy left Epiphany after I had taken them public, and he said, hey, you ought to come meet Mark Andreessen. And I said, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea, right? I'll, I'll take you up on that. Um, so that was really what started it all. So I ended up kind of, you know, was about to have, we were about to have our first kid, and I came home one day, and I told my wife, and I said, look, I met this guy, Mark Andreessen. He's going to change the world for this company called LoudCloud. And the idea behind LoudCloud, for those of you who weren't here, was basically, um, could we make effectively compute a utility, right? So just like today, right, you plug your you know, plug it into the wall jack, you don't care about how the electricity got there, right? It's just a utility. Our theory was, could you make computers that way, compute that way, and then, you know, developers could develop their own code, they would just literally plug it into an infrastructure and it would work. And, you know, the good news is, I think we had a good idea because it kind of turned out to be Amazon Web Services. Uh, we were way too early and did, you know, lots of, had lots of challenges that made us ultimately not successful. But anyway, so that's, that's kind of how I got there. And then, you know, I think like a lot of things in life, you kind of, you get lucky to get somewhere, and then hopefully you prove yourself and you demonstrate that you're trusted and you're, you know, can, can do good work, and, and you hook yourself to good people who hopefully bring you along. Any, any hard decisions along the way that turned out to be great and those not so great? Any learning experiences that you can share, kind of take some pain away from some of these entrepreneurs? <laughs> well, look, I mean, I think the biggest learning experience, which uh, everyone here knows, having, is who's interested in the entrepreneurial community, is it's just hard to build a business. And like, I don't think we should kid ourselves. And you have to be, you have to be at least partly crazy to think that you're gonna go quit your job and you know, try to go raise money and do something that everybody tells you probably can't be done. 
uh, because you know if everybody told you it could be done, it would be obvious, and there'd be 50 other people doing it. And so, you know, LoudCloud was one of these companies where uh, we lived in the glory days of the bubble for our first about six months of the company. So we started the business in September '99. You know, the bubble kind of technically peaked in April 2000, if you remember the numbers. By that time, we had raised you know over 150 million dollars. We had hired 600 people, and you know we thought the world was our oyster, right? And there was nothing you know nothing we could do wrong. And then of course you know everything comes to a screeching halt, and you know we end up having to do multiple layoffs, which you know as, as I'm sure people know as a manager is probably the most difficult and unpleasant thing to ever have to do because you know you literally have to tell people through no fault of their own that you literally can't afford to have them on anymore. So, you know I, I think to me the biggest learning was just. You know, as unpleasant as it is, number one, as a manager, those are the those are incredible learning experiences, and I, I wouldn't say seek out, you know, kind of trouble. But if you're in trouble like that, you know, the opportunity that you have to grow as a manager and to really think about, you know, how can you learn and how can you kind of develop into a better person, uh, is tremendous in that opportunity. And we went through a bunch of iterations of the company, but um, look, I think the biggest lesson is just at the end of the day is, you know, if you're going to do this, you have to know that, you know, there are things that look like bubbles and they tend to be mirages, and at some point in time. The real world actually kicks in, yeah. and uh, you know it ain't gonna be easy. Yeah, I, I had a, a client call me up uh, a little while ago, and said he was whinging on about, man, this is so hard and so <laughs> difficult. This is so hard, and you know, I guess part of our jobs as lawyers is psychotherapy. You know, right. we listen, and you know, yeah, you know, it'll get better, it'll get easier, and then you know, he was whinging on and whinging on, and and finally, after about five ten minutes, I said, George, I just got to tell you. I've never yet had an entrepreneur call me up and say, man, this is so much easier than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. I mean, what you guys do is really, really hard. Well, it's not, yeah. it's, to be clear, it's not what we do. It's what, obviously, we get the pleasure well, yeah, of working the, with. The, the you know, Our are, job relative to what entrepreneurs do is, yeah. is, is much easier. But yeah, look, it, it's, it's, it's hard and it's crazy. And, but I think that's, it's kind of the way it should be, right? Yeah. Which is, look, if you're going to build something valuable, you're going to have to walk through walls. You're going to do stuff that people will tell you crazy. You have to go against the grain to do stuff. And you know, the reward, if you can get there, obviously, is tremendous. Yeah. So you've been involved with Andreessen, you know, from the beginning. Yep. And besides becoming a bigger and hotter fund, um, how have you seen it evolve over the years in terms of its core investment philosophies, its principles? And, um, and the second part to this is, it comes from Will in San Diego, if you're tuning in. Uh, how do you see the profile of these companies that you're investing in uh, changing over the next, say, five to ten years? Yep. Yeah. So let me talk a little bit about kind of the firm itself and kind of you know where we've gone from and where we come from and where we're going to. So um, the short answer on what's changed and evolved is you know we've grown a lot, but the core philosophy for the firm actually hasn't changed. So let me make sure at least you understand how we think about it. The basic idea behind the firm is could we create an environment that hopefully could take tremendously you know successful and and uh, brilliant people who, as I said, are kind of you know crazy enough to think they can change the world and give them an environment where hopefully they can you know we can augment what they're doing by accelerating all the efforts around how they go to market, how they think about building a team and all this other stuff. And so one of our one of our kind of uh, predilections, which is not a requirement, but often if you look at our portfolio, you'll see we do like the idea of kind of founding technical CEOs. And that's just because we have a general view that um, you know these are most of what we invest in tend to be product companies, and we like the idea that there's an affinity between the person who founds the company and therefore has the vision for what the product can be, and also can be the CEO and therefore kind of you know control the resources for the company and think about how best to deploy resources. And as I said, that's not 100% true across our portfolio, but certainly a preponderance of what we do tends to look like you know that type of that type of founder. Um, and when we started the firm, we said, okay. In many cases, if you back a founder like that, it may be that there are other skills they just haven't developed because it hasn't been part of their core professional work, either because they're a first-time founder or because they come from a technical background, so they may not be an expert at sales, they may not be an expert at you know, hiring and other things. And so the whole design around the firm was, if we're gonna have this characteristic of founder, what other things could we do that would hopefully kind of allow them to develop those skills over time, and in the meantime, could we effectively augment their skill set with access to relationships and networks that we could build as a firm. So just to give you an example, um, we're a little bit of an odd beast from a venture capital perspective in that we have 125 people in the firm today. And 80 of those 125 people work with our portfolio companies post-investment. And I won't bore you with the details of all the things they do, but the basic charge for those 80 people is how can we as a firm build relationships with potential large customers, with 
uh, members of the press and media who could be helpful from a marketing perspective with future investors, with executives, with you know members of the engineering community in a way where we can kind of augment and almost pour fuel onto the fire for everything you're doing as a company. So you know, as a, as a new product CEO, you may not know the CIO of you know, a big company who could be a potential customer. We ought to be able to kind of cultivate that relationship and then be able to kind of marry those and say, hey, now you have an opportunity to get to that CEO. And over time, our hope, of course, is that might create a sales or a business development opportunity for you. So that's kind of been the core philosophy of the firm. And obviously, we built it out. We didn't start with 125 people. But the basic idea and this basic theory around kind of technical product-based founders hopefully becoming the long-term CEO uh, was really kind of the foundation for how we thought about the business. So that was your differentiator from all other VCs, really, this added support, the services. Yeah, yeah there, were really, there were really two fundamental differentiators. So one was, yes, this kind of you know, additional group that we call the operating functions, which, again, are about relationship development and bringing that to bear to the companies. The second is, if you look at our general partners, uh, we have nine general partners today. All of them have been either founders or CEOs. Uh, and you know, there are, of course, other venture firms that have general partners with that characteristic. Uh, we decided to kind of make that a core part of the, the qualification for being a general partner. And the theory is exactly the same, which is if we're going to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, go into business and bet on people who may not have had the experience of being a CEO before or kind of developing a company to scale, then we ought to put somebody on your board who can be a sounding board for those types of things and help you think about everything from, you know, organizational development to when to bring in new executives to, you know, how do I think about communicating to the company? You guys have done a great job in terms of getting the word out because, uh, on the street, you're known as really founder friendly, um, and when you know when founders often talk about potential for getting you know ousted from their own company, and Dreesen is never you know Dreesen Horowitz is never one of those companies. You guys really have a, a great um, track record of, of really building up uh, entrepreneurs, and I think you know it's something that the community really appreciates. Oh, I, I appreciate that, and we you know just to be totally balanced, right? As you know, right? There are times where. There are times where you know sometimes a founder doesn't develop into that long-term yeah. CEO, but it, it, kind of the way we think about it is if we go into an investment thinking that we really believe this person can't be the long-term CEO, it's probably better for us just not to the investment because it's so counter our yeah. thinking. Now that is also it's also the case that yes, over time, if founders can't develop and can't you know become the long-term CEO, then yes, there are times where you have to think about making that change. But you're right, that's kind of a fundamental part of how we think about that role of, as CEO. So what, in your view, are, are some of the key ingredients that a successful startup you know, has to have? Yeah. So, uh, number, so it's, it may not be a successful startup, but if we say a successful venture-funded startup, and, and, and why I mean that is, look, there are lots of great businesses out there that generate cash flow and can be very, very good financial returns for lots of people. The key for whether a venture capital firm is the right firm to actually you know, seek capital from is, number one, is market size. And, the reason is because when you think about our business, uh, the you know this is either a feature or a bug depending on, on how you view it. But basically, in our business, um, at least half you know 40 to 50 percent of what we do, we're going to lose all of our money, right? And so, if the analogy I like to use is uh, for anybody who's a baseball player, you know when you look at baseball players, there's you have a batting average and then you have a slugging percentage. So a batting average says, okay, you know for each time you get up to the plate how many times do you actually get a hit as opposed to getting an out, right? And you know, in venture capital, the answer is, look, you know, it's at best five out of 10, right? Meaning you're gonna strike out and literally lose all your money five out of 10 times. And then probably you know, two, three times, you might get your money back or get a little bit of money back. But the only thing that makes a difference between a successful venture capital firm and a not successful venture capital firm is the slugging percentage, which is what amount of dollars end up in that kind of 10 to 20 to 50x kind of return bucket to make up for all those losses and then ultimately hopefully provide some profit. So like a slugging percentage in baseball, a slugging percentage says, when I get a hit, are those singles or doubles or triples or home runs? So in venture capital, you know, when you get a hit, you're measured by the magnitude of that hit as opposed to how many times you strike out. So Tam, so Tam is one of them. So that's why market size becomes yeah. so important. And it's not because we don't like businesses in small markets, but it's just our business fundamentally doesn't work if you build a business that's a fantastic business but can only get to a certain scale. So market size is obviously critically important. Um, two, which is, you know, I'd say probably, uh, and I think of market size as it's kind of the, you know, it's the first gating item, which is if you don't think the market size is big, it's probably not worth going on to things two and three right. because the business probably just doesn't work as a venture finance business. 
Um, look, team is, is by far, once you get past market size, the most important thing. Uh, in part because, look, at an early stage, the honest answer is there's nothing else to evaluate, right? So, you know, lots of what we do is either seed stage or, you know, A round stuff where there's no product. You know, we're, we're opining on what the market like might look like if, in fact, there's a product which doesn't exist yet. So the only thing we have to measure is, okay, um, assume the market exists and it's big. Um, the question is now, can this team actually build that product for this market? Uh, and if it's an interesting market, let's assume there's going to be five or ten other teams like this that will come in there. So why should we back this team versus waiting for you know any number of those that might walk through the door the next three, six, you know, twelve months, right? So so much of that is team, and so much of that goes to where we started this discussion, which is you know qualitative issues around you know is there stick to itness in this team? Is there something in their background uh, which we think about kind of this idea of uh, founder market fit equivalent to you know kind of the concept that people talk about product market fit right which is what is it about this founder's background that makes them uniquely suited to do this business and do they have some kind of special knowledge or some secret or something that they earned through that background that convinces us that yes this team is actually the right team to go after this market and they're the right people to bet on is, is that can deep talk domain about. expertise sort of a prerequisite yeah you know you you look, in an ideal world, yes, right? And particularly if you're talking about a deep product company, right? So, you know, if somebody's going to come in, you know, we have a person who's actually a, a general partner of ours now, Martin Casado. Uh, Martin started a company called Nasira uh, several years ago that we were lucky enough to back, and it ultimately got sold to VMware for about a billion and a quarter dollars, a very successful, you know, business and a very successful exit. You know, Martin was kind of the typecast person for this business. It was in the software-defined networking space. And so he literally had spent, you know, his first career, four years in his career at the NSA, basically coming up with the idea of software-defined networking by looking at how the military really kind of creates networks and environments that are conducive to the type of computing they're doing. And then he went to Stanford and spent, you know, three or four years doing his PhD thesis coming up with this idea. And so, you know, if you can find that, which there aren't that many, right, that's great product market, or sorry, founder market fit, right, which is, hey, there's probably nobody who has deeper domain knowledge who also has firsthand knowledge of the problem, has struggled with it for eight years, and now kind of has said, this is actually the product that I know people will use. You know, it doesn't always work that way, but we like to think of a, um, I'll give you one more analogy, and then I apologize, I'm going on oh, long no. on this question. The way we often think about it is, is there something um, organic about how this person got to the problem and therefore decided to start a company. Um, and so we use the terms internally, um, kind of company first versus product first. So uh, don't tell anybody else, by the way, that we're giving you all this inside baseball. But, but the, the I'm basic, sure there's no one watching. There's nobody watching, yeah. right? Uh, everybody's watching Joe Biden tonight on yeah. the Democratic convention. It's a good thing we're not competing against Hillary tomorrow. We'd be in real yeah. trouble. Um, <laughs> but. Um, what that means is, you know, company first, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, kind of exaggerating for, for purpose, but company first means, hey, you and I decide we want to start a company, let's go sit on the whiteboard, let's throw 5,000 ideas on, and then we decide, you know, this is a really cool idea, let's go do it. And that's fine, and there are good businesses that, that come out of that. Product first is that organic process of saying, there's some experience in my life or something that I've been studying where, you know, I kind of came up with a product, a solution to a problem, and I felt so compelled by it that I just had to build a company around it, you know. All other things be equal, right? That's a much more compelling, you know, thing to, to back as a company. So, you know, we yeah. look for those types of things that give us kind of confidence around that team piece. I think I've, I've seen with uh, entrepreneur clients where they're solving their own problem. Yeah. You know, it really, uh, that they, they feel it in a way that people that are just looking for something sort of on a whiteboard, yeah. they just don't yeah. see. Right. And as I said, look, there yeah. are successful companies that come yeah. out of both, but when you're grasping for something to kind of, you know, really sink your teeth into as an early stage venture yeah. capitalist, that gives you more comfort. So TAM, team. So we talked about TAM, team. And then, um, look, I, I would say product, but I would put product in quotes uh, mostly. Again, this is all stage dependent, right? So we can talk about financials and other stuff at the, you know, at particularly at the later stage. The, the reason I put product in quotes is it's highly likely that the product you think of it today is not going to be the product you end up with, right? Just like, uh, you know, the classic example of whatever financial model you show us today is going to bear no resemblance to the one that you show us when we walk into the first board meeting. And that's OK. We understand that. And that's, that's, that's part of life. But um, part of the product is, you know, do you think that they can build it? Part of it is, is there a way for you to vet that it actually has, you know, real market need, right? And, and that's, again, a more qualitative discussion than a quantitative discussion. And then part of it also is, do you believe this team has, this goes back to team again, has the depth of domain expertise and the kind of positive malleability to know that as they go through kind of the product maze, they will eventually kind of incorporate all the data that kind of goes from what they thought the product was today to something over here, which turns out to be the right product. So 
you know, we're less worried about, you know, do you know exactly what that product is today, but how did you decide based on the market need that your current conception of the product is right, and then do we think you will be smart enough and malleable enough and flexible enough to kind of really incorporate the feedback in over time to get to what turns out to be the actual right product for the business. So this kind of leads into the next question. So where do you guys like to come in in the growth cycle yep. of the company? Um, you know, what point do you, do you come in? You've done early stage, you've done late yep. stage, but what's yep. sort of your sweet spot? So uh, if you look at our portfolio, uh, basically about uh, close to 80% of what we've done is either seed or A round stuff. So, uh, you know, what I would consider, you know, seed or literally first institutional money in. Uh, and about 20% of the portfolio is what I would call growths, which, you know, could be, you know, C round or D round, things that have some revenue and some product uh, perspective as well. So, look, all other things being equal, we'd much rather be as early as possible, right? Uh, there are, you know, the times where you might not want to be early is where you say, hey, you know, we're not sure yet that there's really enough for us to evaluate to kind of deal with some of those issues around market and team and other stuff. And so the risk reward of being early and wrong is not as good as potentially waiting for some of those, you know, kind of, you know, dots on the computer screen to kind of materialize in a way that you can actually make a more informed decision. So, um, you know, that, that would be something that might counsel you to go a little bit later. But, you know, in general, our view is, if there's enough information where we can kind of make an informed decision at that early stage, it's a much better place for us to be. Um, you know, number one, just as a company, you know, uh, look, the economics of the business, as you know, right, you know, so of course, the earlier you're in, certainly, you know, the more, uh, you know, economics, the more the economics makes sense if it turns out to be a winner. Um, but also just the way we're set up as a firm, um, you know, kind of we're okay taking that early stage risk because we do think that we have kind of an infrastructure that we can surround people with as they go through that initial, you know, kind of development phase of the company. It was interesting. I heard a VC, a little bit of a, uh, a digression, yeah. talking about FOMA, you know, uh, fear of missing out in the venture community. And yeah. then some later stage investors were saying there's now this uh, JOMA, you know, um, joy of missing joy out. Of missing out, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I'm like, I mean, I think, I think at the end of the day, look, the way we think about our job is, um, you know, we, we need to find incredible people who are doing incredible breakthrough things as early as possible, and we should do that and recognize that, yes, the attrition rate's going to be high. Unfortunately, you know, it's not a fun thing, but that's the nature of the business, and, you know, that, that will be true independent of cycles and, and, you know, economic, you know, macro issues and things of that sort. So, uh, you know, they say a smart man learns from his mistakes, a wise man learns from other people's mistakes. So we <laughs> want to, you know, try and make everybody as wise as possible here. Uh, so w what are some of the most common mistakes that you and the other uh, Andreessen partners constantly, uh, consistently see uh, entrepreneurs making in their businesses? Are there any, oh, yeah. you know? Yeah, we've been talking about a lot of this lately. So. Um, uh, let me kind of start it with um, mistakes that I see when people are pitching to us and then mistakes that we see when people are already, you know, we're already partners. Um, I, I think the biggest mistake that we see when people pitch to us is um, they tell us what they think we want to hear. And the honest answer is, um, look, we recognize you don't have the answers to every problem, uh, but we really want to know the depth of your understanding of the industry. And um, you know, we don't want you to kind of, you know, come into a pitch with us and, you know, for example, after 20 minutes of listening to your pitch, for me to make a suggestion for you about how to go to market or how to build a product and for you to say, you know, actually, yeah, that's a great idea, we should go do that, right? Now, it may turn out that my idea is a great idea, but that kind of makes me question at least the depth of your convictions around what you're trying to do. Um, and again, I'm not saying like just arbitrarily say no every time a VC gives you a suggestion, although that's probably, you'd probably be right more times than you'd be wrong if you just, if you did that. But Again, when you think about what we're evaluating, there's nothing, there's very little at the early stage quantitative for us to evaluate. So, so much of our evaluation is you, your ability to kind of articulate the story, your, your ability to kind of convince us that the market is there when it doesn't, isn't there. And things that detract from that, like, you know, me being able to change your mind after 30 seconds of listening to your presentation, right, make, make people question, you know, kind of really your conviction and the depth of your understanding. So, I would put that under the general rubric of, you know, telling us things that, you know, kind of we, we, they, people think we want to hear. The other thing I find a lot, which um, is funny, is I think people also want to hear, people believe we want to hear, there's lots of acquirers out there that will acquire this business. And that may very well be true, but again, when you go back to our economics and you think about the VC business, for better or worse, you know, a lot of what we do is going to fail. So the only way our business works is if you are trying to build and you believe the market can sustain a billion dollar plus, you know, company over time, right? And so it's great if in the failure case there's lots of, you know, people who can buy the company, but 
for us to go into a deal thinking that you're optimizing for that outcome or that that's really how you're thinking about the business, again, is just, is just inconsistent with how we think about our business model. So I know people think that that kind of is a de-risker sometimes, but in many cases that, you know, this is not, this is not a de-risking business for better or worse, right? Like we don't win, we don't win by, you know, buying, you know, muni, muni bonds basically, right? So like we, we understand the risk and we think about this as we're solving for asymmetric outcomes, right? So we can only lose the money we put in your company, and if, if you're right and you build this great business, then, you know, there's an asymmetric upside opportunity. So, you know, we'll solve for risk through portfolio management. We don't need you to solve for risk through, uh, you know, kind of trying to de-risk the exit opportunities for your business. Um, on, the, on the mistakes people make on the other side, look, they're, they're highly varied and, uh, and uh, you know, so it's hard to articulate some stuff. I would say the biggest thing that we've seen particularly given some of the changes in the macro environment, and we can talk about that, is um, I think a lot of our companies do two things, uh, and I think this is true generally of entrepreneurs, is um, people tend to almost in all cases hire executives later than they actually should. And there's always this tension between, hey, you know, I should be able to kind of bootstrap sales, or I should be able to bootstrap, you know, I can also, I can be CEO and I can also run the engineering organization. And, and, and yes, there's a period of time where clearly that makes sense, um, but uh, at least, we generally find that companies wait too long to get to the point where they say, okay, you know, I'm not a domain expert in sales, I'm not a domain expert in marketing, and for the company really to get to the next level, you know, I almost never hear a, C a CEO say, you know, we hired that person too early. It's almost always they say, look, like, you know, we should have had that head of sales on six months earlier. And so, in general, as you think about development of kind of specialization and expertise on the executive side, um, the one specific function that I also think uh, more and more particularly companies are realizing is it doesn't need to be a CFO, but some kind of finance partner. Um, we were having a, a discussion on this today actually at our firm, and the way we kind of counsel people is, you know, when you get, when you get through the kind of initial product building phase and you're really starting to think about go to market, um, it's really important to have a finance partner, whether that's a CFO or VP of finance or somebody who can really say, okay, great, you know, now that we're going to go to market, how do we think about, you know, what's the, you know, value through marketing? What's the conversion funnel look like? You know, what should the sales organization look like? What do quotas look like? All these other things that kind of, you know, become measurable at that point in time. I think um, that kind of discipline really is something that, again, I think as founders, people tend to kind of want to put that off. But again, in almost all cases, we find that once founders do that, they realize that kind of the value they could have gotten earlier on in the business uh, is dramatically different. I think one of the things that I always uh, counsel my clients when they go into uh, VC meetings is just to be genuine yeah. and authentic. Yeah. You know, I think that you know people um, get so uptight about these meetings, and it's, it's totally understandable sure. because you know often it's it's sort of a one-time shot, and uh, so they have a tendency potentially to not be themselves, and it's hard yeah. uh, when you've got all this pressure of this meeting. But I think um, I think people can detect. You know, when, when someone is not genuine, when they're just not yeah. being authentic, so. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And look, I, I completely understand why it's it's tough, right? I mean, you've, you know, you've basically, you know, quit your job, right? And, you know, you have no income, right? And you're you're trying to obviously figure out a way to get something off, off board. But I agree with you. It, it's okay to be, it's okay to be vulnerable and it's okay to not know the answers to everything. Like, you know, nobody expects you to do that. People are much more interested in the depth of your thinking around issues. And if there's open issues, that's great. Tell us, right? And you don't have to be, so cocksure about everything that, you know, kind of, there's no, there's no mistakes. So much of what, um, at least I think we, I'll, I'll at least speak for us, what we're evaluating is, you know, kind of, number one, domain expertise, but also kind of your, really kind of your general leadership capabilities, right? And so, you know, can you, can you tell a story in a compelling way that will cause employees to want to work for you, that will cause customers who don't know who you are to be able to want to, you know, write a check for you, right? And, and so much of that is kind of, it's storytelling, it's leadership, it's, it's those things that are, you know, it's hard to fake them, right? But, um, but you know, th that's the kind of depth of character that we're trying to get to because, you know, look, it's a competitive environment. There are lots of employees out there who have lots of choices. Why should some employee go work for you? You've got to be able to tell them a real compelling story as to why this opportunity is so great. And, and, and that's a lot of what we're trying to assess at that stage. And I, yeah, I think that brings up an interesting point because often founders will say, hey, you know, I know we got to have a team, but how do I have a team without money? And I say, yeah. if you're an A plus CEO, you're going to have the ability to sell people to come to work for you for equity and buy into your vision. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's easy when you've got $5 million in funding yeah. and pay market salaries and equity. Yeah, absolutely easy to pick people up. But, you know, you've got to have that, that ability. 
And yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, no, I, th I think that's right. And, and, uh, and, and just to be totally clear, uh, I use storytelling, and you said the word selling, not me. But um, <laughs> you know, I'm not suggesting that you like say things that aren't true or that oh, you no. uh, that you do anything. Uh, but but it's you know, but it, but you need to be able to you need to be able to wrap it into something compelling, right? I mean, again, like if I'm an engineer in the valley, I've got 50 or 100 different companies that I can work for that will probably pay me a lot more money than you'll pay me. And so there's got to be something other than just like this is a paycheck that really makes this compelling. And, and again, I think that's a lot of what we're trying to kind of suss out. Yeah. When, we, when we do these early stage deals. So uh, why don't we take a, a question from the audience and then one from the virtual audience and then we'll come back. Uh, do we have a question from the audience? Yeah. Could you just repeat the question? Um, uh, so we could just hear it for the entire audience? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, my question specifically is like how sector uh, agnostic or you know, sector specific yeah. you are with respect to your investment, yeah. uh, especially in regulated domains like surface transportation or yeah, other yeah, yeah. areas, like how interested would you be in something like that? Yeah, so um, uh, basically the way we describe our domain is, uh, you may have read my partner Mark Andreessen wrote this uh, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal now going on six years ago called Software is Eating the World, right? Which is, you know, now seems very commonplace at the time. Obviously, it was you know it was something that people hadn't heard before. But you know the, the way we think about that is that kind of describes our domain, which is you know industries and or technologies where software and automation obviously can be important components of the business. At least we ought to look at it, and then we ought to go do the work to say, okay, within this vertical industry, do we do we understand it enough to make a bet? So when you look at our portfolio. Um, the simple way to think about our portfolio is about half of our businesses are consumer-facing businesses. So, you know, a Twitter, a Pinterest, an Airbnb, right? So basically, you know, companies where the consumer is the end user customer. And about half of ours are enterprise-facing companies, you know, a networking company, a storage company, an application company, right? Um, within that, uh, the honest answer is we try to be about as domain agnostic as possible. Uh, mostly, and different firms vary on this, but we don't sit around at the beginning of the year and say, okay, Here's our five investment themes for the year. Now let's go find 20 companies that actually fit those investment things. And there are firms, by the way, who do this very successfully. Um, our view is um, we're just not smart enough, quite frankly, to be able to know everything there. And what we really want is we want to know what smart entrepreneur is going to walk in the door tomorrow with some idea that we never thought about. And then let's go do the diligence on that industry and say, OK, yeah, is, are we comfortable with the regulatory risk? Are we comfortable with, the, you know, knowing what we don't know, basically, right? Um, so that's really, I would say, we're much more bottoms up. We use this term internally, again, uh, to give you inside baseball. We, we use this term called prepared mind, which is we, we obviously have biases and ideas about what we like and what we do, and we want to do research on things. But we want to do that to be prepared for when people walk in, as opposed to that becoming the kind of tops-down thesis for the business. So you, you think I can, be, I can come over to you? <laughs> <laughs> do I have to commit you on the spot for that? Or not? No, look, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, in general, I would say, look, we are, there's very, we, we we use this term also, which you know is look. It's not. We don't think it's smart for VCs to redline, redline industries right now. There are things where you know we all have nightmares from having invested in some area where you know we we probably just you know mentally redline it because there's no way we could ever go through the horror of you know that industry again. But in general, our view is look, that's a dangerous thing to do when you start redlining. Now you're basically reducing your opportunity set. And so, yeah, the short answer is look, I have no idea what you do, but. You know, I would say I would take I would take the bet that at least uh, you know we should look at it and and if not I'll come back to you and say hey look like you know we're too traumatically you know shocked by this industry that we can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Mike, uh, do we have anything uh, from our virtual community? Yeah. Hear me? Yeah, uh, just talk a little louder. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, now you can hear me. Sound like the Verizon. Uh, Scott, this isn't one of the questions, but great boots. <laughs> from what? From where? Your boots. Oh, oh, boots. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. Oh, Montana, sorry. Idaho. Houston. <laughs> Houston, all right. Houston. Okay, so uh, Slido's great because we, we moved all the questions over, and these are uh, a couple of the highest rated questions. Okay, cool. And we'll start this one from Dan, and he didn't put his city, so we'll just say New York. Um, <laughs> where do the introductions for your most likely startups yeah. come from? So, yeah. this is obviously historical. Yeah, yeah. So, um, they tend to come, in most cases, if I look at the, the deals we've done to date, they tend to come from some referral source that we've cultivated and we know because, you know, they are just kind of 
part of what I would consider kind of a connector or a network node in the business, right? right? So um, sometimes there are, you know, there are people who are, I don't know if it's downstream or upstream, what's the right way to describe it, but there are people right. who are upstream of us, meaning they, they invest even earlier than we do, right? So sometimes they're, you know, sometimes they're incubators, right? Sometimes they are literally, you know, individual angel investors. But, you know, as you are in this business for a while, you tend to kind of get to know who the repeat players are. And so a lot of our job, quite frankly, is to spend time with those people and say, hey, what are you seeing and what's happening? So a lot of it comes, comes from that. Now that we're getting older uh, in terms of like we actually have a portfolio, um, you know, a lot of our referrals come from other CEOs in the portfolio who say, hey, you know, I met this person the other day, they're doing something cool, you guys ought to talk to them. Right. Um, we, we do get, you know, as you would expect, right, we get a lot of stuff that just comes over the transom. And uh, the honest answer is we, we do look at it all. I will just tell you, um, the track record on those turning into deals is extremely low. Right. Um, and it's not, it's not, and part of it is, and this may sound silly, is um, it's a little bit of uh, a test of your mettle as an entrepreneur, which is you ought to be able to find some way right. to get something other than a cold intro to us, right? right? Like, and you know, it's not it's not rocket science, right? Like you could probably figure out somebody who knows one of the 125 people at our firm. Right. And so, you know, we don't we don't dismiss those things, but like I'd much rather, it, it's a sign of your Got kind it. of, you know, kind of stick to itness as entrepreneur that you you figured out the kind of network maze to at least get mm -hmm. somebody who knows us to introduce us. Yeah, I, that's absolutely true. Um, Can I have a couple more? Do you want me to keep Let's going? Let's do one more, yeah. Okay. Again, this is uh, anonymous, but it's kind of interesting. How does your firm feel about Seoul founders? Uh, Seoul, how oh, many Seoul. of your Seoul? Not, how many not of your Seoul Korea. Yeah, not okay. Seoul. Okay. <laughs> S O L E. Okay. Yeah. Um, how many of your portfolio investments began as sole founder companies? Yeah, we just looked at this actually the other day for a completely unrelated reason. Um, it's definitely a significant minority of our companies. So if I look at our companies, um, we've got about roughly 90. Um, this is I just I just looked at this for board seats. So 90 companies today that we sit on the board. We have seed companies, obviously, where uh, that are more than that, but we don't sit on the board. Of our board companies, uh, fewer than 15 of the 90 started with a single founder. Um, and, and I'll be very honest, like that's not, it's really not an issue for us one way or another, right? I think the question, what, one of the questions we do like to ask when we see, you know, more than one founder is how did, how did you get together and why did you get together? And again, you know, what we love to see, of course, is that more organic thing. Either, you know, literally we grew up together and we always had this idea and it was the right time to do it or, you know, I'm a domain expertise in life sciences, and I'm a domain expertise in artificial intelligence, and we're putting through together. So, it's not, it's it's certainly not a, um, it's not a knockout at all uh, from our perspective to not have, uh, you know, another founder. I, I think the reality just is, quite frankly, that the vast majority I would expect of prospects are multiple founders, and therefore it probably mirrors what we see in our portfolio. Great, thank you. So, uh, just turning to uh, to funding. Yep. Um, so when I, you know, engage with clients in terms of uh, developing a funding strategy, we try and identify funds that we think would be a good fit. We, you know, fit the fund thesis, uh, the stage. Um, we try and look for the venture partners that we think would make, you know, good partners. Uh, what, what advice, you know, just as you guys do a lot of diligence on the founders and on the company, what advice can you give to the entrepreneurs in terms of what, what they should be looking for from VCs, yeah. uh, you you guys have you know something special in this sort of additional value add services sure. that yeah. you provide, but that's that's an outlier. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, what should they be looking for? And and do you, do you agree with Kosler who said that you should really be looking for a VC that can help you hire? Yeah. So. Um I mean, look, uh, Vinod's brilliant, so I, I won't ever, I shouldn't, I shouldn't ever <laughs> directly disagree with Vinod. Um, but, but look, I think the things that you should care about as an entrepreneur, you know, I'm not gonna talk our own book, so forget about our approach to the business, uh, and, and you know, you can, I'll let you decide on your own whether that's valuable. But the way I would approach it is um, uh, in a couple areas. Number one is, look, you know, I know this is an overused metaphor, but like you really are, you really are getting married, right? So, you know, we're going from dating for probably, you know, a week or two to effectively getting engaged and then getting married. And, you know, uh, you know, the, the success rate of marriages obviously is not very good. So you'd expect the success rate of uh, those types of forced marriages aren't any better. Um, and so what I mean by that is, look, you, you have to think about this is a 10, 12, 13 year engagement, right? And so, um, you know, so much I think of what people ought to think about, and sometimes I think they don't, is what's the affinity between your objectives as an entrepreneur and what the objectives of that firm are, right? And so, you know, as an example, you know, what I said is, look, for us, 
we want to believe going in that there is an opportunity to build a standalone multi-billion dollar business. And that's not true of all businesses, and that's fine. That's not a normative statement about whether a business is good or not. That's just kind of what our business model is. So look, if you think you have a great idea, but you think it's an interesting business where you can get it to $50 million, and then what you really want to do is you think it's better as part of a bigger company, you want to sell it, that's a perfectly fine objective, but that's inconsistent with the goals, at least if, if you're going to try to take money from us, right? So you, don't, you want to kind of suss those things out, which is what are they optimizing for, and, and, and is that compatible with what you're optimizing for? I do think this issue of founder as CEO or not is an important one, right? And again, I, this is not a normative statement at all, but there are CEOs who've been incredibly, uh, excuse me, venture capital firms who've been incredibly successful where, Sorry. you know, they're not... Um, come to you. Yeah. Oh, thanks. You know, they're not, they don't like love kicking CEOs out, but right, but they have more of a predilection to put a professional CEO in earlier in the process than maybe we might be comfortable with, right? And again, uh, this is not, I'm not making an enormous statement, but I just think you have to understand those types of things. Um, the other thing I would just think about is, Again, if you assume your journey is going to be a long one and you're going to have the requirement to raise, you know, probably lots of capital over time, that's just the nature of obviously what this business is, there's other subtle things to think about, right, which is, okay, do, you know, can this firm support me over time as I grow and as my capital needs re require? And that doesn't mean that you have to only raise money from billion-dollar firms, but if you raise from, let's just say, a $100 million fund, then you just have to know and be comfortable that they're not likely to be a big funding source for you down the line, and that may be perfectly fine, but you just have to understand and think about that going in. Or if you're going to a firm where they haven't raised a new fund in a long time and they're kind of late in terms of, you know, that fund's been out for four or five years, again, you just gotta think about, am I comfortable taking potential risk that, you know, all my future funding is going to have to come from someplace else. So I think those are some of the nuances to think about. But I think the most important one is, look, it's a relationship business. And so if you can't stand being in the room with that person and, you know, kind of sitting at board meetings for them and being willing to listen to them and take advice, I think that's great. Um, look, I think helping hire is a fantastic thing, and that's a great value add for, for, uh, for venture capitalists. Um, I think, you know, again, the way we think about it more is, um, how can we ex effectively expand your network, right? And so I'm not gonna go be your recruiting arm. That's not, that's not a good thing, right? You need to be a world-class recruiter to run a company. But if I can get you access to candidates and put them in your candidate pool that you might have not been able to get to because you know, I have a broader reach than you do as a new startup, like, I think that's highly valuable. Yeah. So do you agree with the point of view that a VC's operational background uh, does not translate into helping founders run companies, but really just gives them the ability to empathize. <laughs> um, you know, because often, you know, yeah. founders will be going through the, the list of VCs and the venture partners, and they go, oh wow, you know, that guy built a company, sold it for 500 million, you know, I'd yeah. love to have him on our board, he'll help us scale. But does it, tra does it translate to, to really helping? Look, I think it's, I mean, look, it's highly person specific, so I think you have to do your diligence on that. Our view, at least, is, there's certainly an element of empathy, right? Which is, look, you know, it's a hard slog, it's tough, and so like, you know, it's in anything you do in life, right? And sometimes it's good to be able to talk to someone who has, you know, been down that road before and, and learn from them. Um, but I, I think it, I think it does. I think if done right, it extends more beyond empathy, particularly when you're talking about, you know, kind of first-time founders, right, who just have never done this before, right? There's no manual that tells you how to be a CEO, right, and, and rightly so because it's a learned experience, right? So, you know, I think the things that at least we believe in particular, you know, we can do that can be helpful is, you know, think about, okay, when is the right time to bring in the head of sales, for example, or, gee, you know. How do you think about, you know, what's your compensation philosophy? Or how do you think about kind of, you know, communication to your employees? You know, other stuff that are important in terms of, you know, building the culture for the firm. You know, there's no magic answers to that. But I do think people who have done that before, um, you know, uh, you know we, we use, you know, kind of, again, the term internally, kind of some experience required, right, which is um, having had that experience of building a company and, and going through that idea maze yourself, you know, I think if you can do that in a way that's empathetic to a founder and also not overbearing, right? Because there's nothing, there's no good that will come from us basically saying this is the way to do it or else, you know, you know, we don't like you anymore. I mean, that's just a silly thing and, and every company is so different. And as board members, we don't really know what's going on inside those companies, right? I mean, you know, anyone who's been on a company or a board knows that, you know, the difference between somebody who spends, you know, a day, a quarter at the company versus somebody who lives and breathes it is so vast. So, we can't give you specific advice on this is what you should do, but we can at least listen to what you're experiencing and saying, okay, based on how we saw these problems in our particular circumstance, this is a way to think about kind of a framework for the problem. Okay, I'll just ask you one more question yeah, and we'll open ahead. it up. So, um, and this comes from uh, Anthony in Dallas. Before the event, I kind of put out an email to our community and said, oh, good. Okay. give us some questions in advance. So Anthony from Dallas 
I uh, would like to get your insight in terms of what you view as seed stage investment and what you view as a typical Series A. <laughs> I think there's, you know, in terms of team, product, customers' evaluation, yeah. there's so much, um, you know, there's so many discrepancies from in people's minds. You know, seed could be just after friends and family, yeah. but if you look at the numbers, it's, an, yeah. it's a $2 million <laughs> round on a six million pre, you know. That's, uh, <laughs> that's funny, uh, this is great. So literally while I was sitting in the front row there, I was going through some emails and um, we have a company coming in tomorrow uh, that's pitching and so we always uh, send out an internal note before for the team who's kind of been spending time with the company just to kind of get everybody at least some base level of understanding for the company. So the, uh, the headline for it was, uh, they're raising a $10 million seed round and I, I, I literally wrote back and I said, man, I am definitely getting old if like $10 million <laughs> is now a seed round. Um, now, it, in, I, I think what's really happened, as you know, right, having been in this business, is kind of the, the names and letters at this point probably don't mean anything, right? So kind of, you know, seed is the new A and, you know, kind of friends and family is the new seed. Everything, there's been great inflation by at least one step, right, uh, in every level. So, um, <coughs> so look, I, I think I would think less about the nomenclature and people do, of course, play games. And, you know, again, we've had lots of people who come in and say, I did a series seed for $4 million and then I did a, you know, seed extension for $7 million, <laughs> and now I'm raising my A round, and then we're like, well, actually, you raised an A for $4 million, you raised a B at seven, and now you're raising a C round, right? Um, but I think the nomenclature probably is le less relevant than, you just gotta think about it from, you know, whatever you call it, you gotta think about it from a stage of maturity and accomplishment perspective, right? So again, in very, very rough terms, look, if I'm funding you at the seed level, then I completely expect you probably have no product, uh, but my hope would be, in general, that what you're gonna do with that seed money is get to a point where you actually have something in market. It doesn't need to be you know, thousands and thousands of customers, but you have a product in market that if we now go raise that A round and we raise $5 million or something, you can go get the first you know, 10, 20, 30 customers or something and show that there is a market for the product you built, right? So, so you have to demonstrate market fit. What you're looking for is demonstrating market fit with the seed round. Yeah, and this yeah. is, by the way, I should be totally clear. So this is a broad generalization. Right, so right. look, there are, there are absolutely it. times where we do an A round where that's not the case. And, you know, sometimes, you know, that's, that's the right thing to do, right? Because yeah. maybe there's, maybe you can't literally, if you're building, let's just say you're building a new storage device or something, probably on $2 million of seed funding, you're not going to get to a full product, right? But maybe you can get to an alpha. So then we can start to at least talk to some customers and say that. So in rough, here's how I think about it, which is, um, I, I use this term today, which um, seemed to go over well, so I'll try it with this audience. I think of kind of seed and A and most B rounds as what I would call the aspirational venture capital financing rounds, meaning basically there's no quantitative metric for us to evaluate you on, so it's all about kind of product, it's, it's all about team building, product building, and you know, of course by a B, I, I would certainly expect you ought to actually have maybe not yet full customers, but you certainly ought to have beta customers and stuff like that. Then, then you get past the aspirational stage and you get to actually, okay, now I have a couple million dollars. Now all that aspirational stuff is, is done with, right? Now I really want to understand go to market and how do you scale it and can you show me a repeatable sales model and things of that sort. So that's a, that's a crasser way to kind of uh, divide it. But yeah, look, if I were, I think most VCs will fund a seed that's pre-product, you know, it's hard to fund an A that's completely pre-product unless it's something you know kind of unique, like say a, a company where the amount of capital you need is just bigger than a seed that you therefore get that pass. You know, by the B round, you know, you don't need millions of dollars, but you ought to have certainly in general, I would expect to see you know some paying customers and a plan for how with the proceeds of that B money you could get to five plus million dollars. And then, you know, again, a C round should, you know, say, okay, great, like it now, it works from a go-to-market perspective in a demonstrable pattern, and then, you know, kind of beyond that is, you know, scale and other stuff. So the B round, you're kind of looking for a scalable, predictable business model already. Yeah, it's not gonna be, you know, again, when we, when we fund at the B round, you're probably not there yet, but you probably, hopefully, if you're a product company, right, you know, hopefully you at least have beta customers who are, we can, we can talk to them and say, yes, like, this thing has value, and when they get me the actual, like, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the GA product, like, I'm, I'm gonna buy it because it has value, but by the time you get to the end of that B, you know, there's no magic number, but look, I think you ought, I think it's reasonable to expect that you've got three to five million dollars of business, and then that C money now is to say, okay, great, you've done three to five million with, you know, an immature go-to-market strategy, now show me, like, what the, you know, Conquer the U.S. plan looks like for sales teams and operations teams and all the other stuff. Questions from the audience? There's someone at the back up here. Hi. Okay, so I have two oh, questions. Uh, first question is, 
How does the process look like from the first introduction meeting towards funding? Okay. Um, uh, highly variant, depending on uh, when that meeting happens. But the way we try to work as a firm is um, we we try to we try hopefully never to have kind of more than two or three what I would call kind of formal meetings. And each of those are kind of you know step functions in terms of the number of people that we might get involved in the firm over time. So often a first meeting might be you know literally one person in the firm, and that person's job is obviously to you know hopefully understand what they're doing and be able to at least relay that to a broader audience and say, hey, I met this person the other day. This is what they're doing. I think it's cool. Does anybody else think it's interesting? And we want to, you know, who else wants to actually spend some time on it? Um, and then a next meeting might be two or three people. And then at that point in time, we try to force ourselves into a deeper discussion and say, okay, we've now consumed two cycles of this entrepreneur. Like, are, are we interested? If so, okay, like what additional information we need and let's go do some of that diligence in cooperation with the entrepreneur before we you know, haul them back in here and have to do another you know, dog and pony show. Uh, or uh, that's often a point in time also where we may say, hey, look, we're, we're just, we don't think we're, we're not serious about moving forward either because you know, we don't think this is the right team or we don't think the market's big enough or we you know, are scared because of you know, a regulatory issue or something like that. And then if, but if, that, if we make it past that, we try to then culminate the final meeting is what we call an all general partner pitch, as creative as that name is, um, where we literally want you to come back and literally pitch to the entire partnership. And so, you know, we've got a big partnership. So, you know, there's nine general partners, and then there often are other people in the room. So it could be as many as 15 or 20 people. And that for us is a decision point meeting, right? Where we say, okay, we have all the information we need. Now, there may still be outstanding diligence items, and that's okay, but we ought to be able to come back to the entrepreneur after that meeting and say, yay or nay, here's what we're doing. If there's outstanding diligence items, we would say, okay, look, we want to do this deal. Um, here's the things that we believe to be true based on what we've heard and learned from you that we haven't yet had time to validate, right? And so let's go do those things either in parallel with issuing a term sheet or let's do those first depending upon the time frame. So that where the process becomes highly variable depending on, you know, obviously how competitive it is and how much time there is. But, you know, in VC, which I think is true of all VCs generally, you know, when VCs issue a term sheet, you know, there's got to be something really, really drastic that happens that would cause a VC not to follow through with the term sheet because this is such a relationship business. And, and, and that's not true, by the way, of other funding sources. And again, this is not a normative statement. It's just different people do different things, right? But, uh, but you know, when we get to the point of issuing a term sheet, you know, modulo, again, us being very clear on, look, here's three things that you know, we still need to do. Like, you know, something, something really dramatic has to happen for us to kind of back away from that. And I just think that's a, I quite frankly, I think that's a good practice that's developed over time in the industry. Yeah, I, I mean, I think one of the differentiators I see between you and a lot of VCs that, that I, I send deals to, um, you're incredibly responsive. Uh, you get back, you know, to me saying, yep, absolutely hook me up with the VC, with the uh, entrepreneur or, you know, glad you send this, but just not for us. Um, so that's great to get that feedback, and then also once they're in the process, uh, you know, it's not sort of this death by a thousand cuts, yeah, yeah. which I, I think from an entrepreneur's perspective is really appreciated. Yeah, I mean, well, really well I appreciate that. Look, a, a fundamental value of the firm is respect for the entrepreneur, right? And we know how there's, you know, unfortunately there has developed a practice in the venture capital community, which you know people call the perpetual maybe, right? Which is we're afraid to offend you, so we kind of say, yeah, we might do this, right? But then, you know. You literally, you have no idea as an entrepreneur where you stand. And so for all of us having been on the other side of raising capital, and you know, I'm guessing people in this room would agree, look, it's much better for me just to come back to you and say, look, it's just not right for us, right? And you know, you know, it, you know, I can give you as much detail or not on it. And sometimes the detail may be, hey, we just had a bad experience with, with you know, a company in this industry. And so like, we're too you know, scorched to actually touch it. But we really do believe that seriously, which is it's, it's way better for us to do that. So every, every entrepreneur, should get you know a very quick answer from us, and then when things go through the process, right? When we when we take more of your time and we actually do these pitch meetings, um, we do send back a more formalized email that says, "Hey, here's you know if we're, particularly if we're you know in the case where we're not going to do it, we we will we will send back a more formalized email that has more specific substance in it." And one of the things we do, um, which I think is unique in the industry, is we actually uh, send out customer satisfaction surveys when we every time we meet an entrepreneur. So we actually track you know our net promoter score. But it's interesting because it's not a net promoter score of our customers, it's a net promoter score of people who we have decided not to do business with, right? But it's so fundamental because it goes back to what I started, which is, look, this is just a relationship business, right? Yeah. So, you know, we don't sell anything, right? You know, there's not, you know, 
all kinds of, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a Coke versus Pepsi business, right, which is, you know, the, the nuances are different and it's reputational issues, it's do you treat people with respect, and so, you know, it, it's, it's a core part of what we try to do. So I appreciate the fact that at least, for, for you at least, we're doing a good job. Hopefully we're yeah. doing a good job for others. Absolutely. Mike, what we got from... Uh, um, from out there in the uh, transom, uh, how much of your latest $1.5 billion fund do you expect to allocate to new portfolio companies versus follow-ons of existing? Yeah, so we just closed, as that, uh, the co question suggested, we just closed on a new fund, same size as kind of what we've done in the past. Uh, we haven't started investing out of it yet, so we'll probably start investing out of it in the fourth quarter, maybe as late as the first quarter. But um, So the short answer to that question, though, is pretty much very little, if any, probably will come from existing portfolio companies. And, and part of that is just kind of a, it's a little bit of a um, way the venture capital business has grown up is, you know, when you raise a fund, right, you have certain limited partners in that fund, and you can do it, but limited partners generally don't want you to do what's called cross-fund investing, because, you know, if I was in fund four, for example, which is our current fund that we're investing, and maybe I changed my allocation in fund five, maybe I invested less for whatever reason or something, um, you know, if you invested in Slack, for example, in fund four, like, as an LP, I feel like that's my opportunity, right? Like, you know, I kind of funded, you know, that opportunity with my money. Why do I want to benefit the people who came into Fund 5, right? So it, it can be done, and we have the flexibility, to be honest, to do it, but we try as much as possible to kind of keep things within their fund family uh, unless there's, you know, it's impossible and, you know, there's no money left and it's just such an incredible opportunity that we say, okay, we'll explain it to our LPs while we're doing a, what's called a cross-fund investment. So a number of, uh, n number of clients in the audience have received uh, seed funding um, and uh, or angel funding, and now they're yep. going for their sort of first institutional round. Um, what are some of the key differences that uh, they should be aware of as they're going into an institutional round? I think the biggest is um, a little bit what we talked about in terms of kind of making sure the marriage is consistent with your objective. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of seed and angel uh, investors who do take a different approach than we might to venture capital funding where, you know, for them, you know, getting a, you know, three three times return or five times return and an early exit from an M&A perspective is perfectly fine and that actually works well for their business model. Um, and so I think really understanding the different incentives that different investors at different stages might have uh, is important. And again, you know, making sure that this may be a great business, but it just may not be that it really is a venture funded business based upon the kind of uh, economic characteristics. Um, look, the other thing is, and this is obviously varies by seed investors, but you know there are a lot of seed, there are a number of seed investors, I should say, who are much more uh, passive in the sense that they literally do write a check, and and you may not ever have any interaction with them. And that's again, this is not a normal statement. I think a lot of that's actually desirable in many cases. Um, whereas you know whatever level of engagement you have with you know your first institutional funder, probably in most cases they're going to want to go on the board, right? So again, you have to be comfortable with that you know intimacy of relationship. And, um, you know, and they are effectively signing up to, you know, go through this journey with you for a, a very long period of time. So I think it really is just kind of that, you know, longevity question, which is, you know, you, know, you, you might have taken money from friends and family, and that's okay, and, you know, you can go see them at Thanksgiving, but no, now you're going to take money from somebody who is probably going to show up at your Thanksgiving uninvited uh, if they haven't heard from you. So, uh, you know, make sure, make sure that you're okay when that happens. Yeah, I, and I think one of the things that I always try and kind of prepare my my entrepreneurs for is uh, the board meetings. Yeah. You know, uh, going from no deck to, That's fair. Yeah. Uh, you know, spending three weeks on a deck, you know, <laughs> uh, is is something that uh, they they find quite puzzling. Yeah, the only thing probably more orchestrated than a board meeting is the, you know, political parties, national conventions. So, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, they're, they're highly orchestrated events, that's for sure. So, um, what do you, uh, what do you see in terms of, um, changes in the way companies are getting funded now. Yeah, yeah. So look, I, I think the simple way I would describe it is, you know, for most of the last seven, eight years, we were kind of in an environment where it was a great environment for pretty much all companies, right? And that's, you know, that's a little bit of overstatement. But in general, funding was available, valuations were good. It was pretty much the case that every 18 months, as long as you, you know, hadn't completely gone off your plan, that there was going to be more capital available at hopefully a higher price than you raised the prior 18 months. Um, and then we had this big switch, right? So we went from great market for all companies to kind of starting in probably November, December, and particularly acute in January, you know, February of this year, where it was a terrible market for any company, right? So like no matter how great you were, basically 
everyone's like, look, we're not touching any of these things. So like, you know, give me give me muni bonds basically instead of you know venture capital. Um, the way I would describe the market right now is um, it's a good market for good companies, meaning that there's more discrimination happening right now, and and uh, and, I, and I mean that in a positive way, which is uh, you know investors and companies are saying, hey, look. Not all companies are created equal, unfortunately, right? And there are some things that are doing really well, and we want to fund them. And there are things that, at the margin, may be great companies but aren't doing well, and we do want to fund those things, but we're going to fund those things. We, we are going to fund those things at different valuations today than we would have funded those 12 months ago. So yeah. the way we kind of break out the world is, look, I would say early stage financing, so kind of seed and A round. Um, the dollar volumes, the deal volumes, at least from where we sit, are pretty consistent with where they've been for the last seven, eight years. And look, there's maybe some softness in valuation where you know if you could have gotten a, you know, a $10 million cap on a seed round before, maybe it's $8 million or something. And I realize 20% is, is not a little. But we're talking about, at the margin, deals getting done with you know either at or slightly below valuations where they have over, over time, but not like catastrophic changes. Um, the biggest changes have clearly happened in the growth end of the market. right? So there's no question, look, if you're a billion dollar plus company today and you go to raise capital today, the price that you can raise today is probably, depending on the kind of company you are, it's anywhere from 25 to 50% less than had you raised the exact same round 12 months ago, right? And you know, I think that's a fine thing in the sense that it's reflecting what has happened in the public markets, which is you know, valuations have changed. And it ought to be the case that the later stage private market ought to more closely track what's happening in the public market. So uh, I don't think that's a hard thing. The hardest rounds to get done today are those kind of that difference, as I was saying, between kind of the aspirational rounds and then the real revenue rounds, right? So if you're going from a B round today to a C round, um, you know, now you've got five million dollars. Now you've got ten million dollars in revenue, and you know the the VC or the other investor can say, okay, well, that five or ten million dollars has a certain value based upon what like a public company would be worth at that level. And yes, you're growing faster, and so you know obviously you should get some credit for that, but you know, we, we've gone out of the realm of aspirational to the realm of there are some quantitative metrics to apply. And the reality is the quantitative metrics have come down in value. And so that's, I think, the, the, the tougher spot in the market right now. And you are seeing, you're seeing deals get done. So it's not, it's not there's no liquidity problem, at least uh, what I'm seeing today. Um, but, you know, but investors are doing deals at prices today that, you know, certainly are, uh, reflect what I think is actually you know, what the public market is saying, but are no question are, are different than where they were 12 months ago. So you're, are you thinking that the IPO market is gonna, as long as the market, you know, remains kind of steady, that yeah. we're gonna see a lot more companies going public as opposed to staying private much longer? Yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting to see. So I think the IPO market is exactly, I would describe the IPO market as exactly I described the private market, which is it's a good market for good companies, right? Yeah. So, you know, we had Twilio, for example, right, you know, not too long ago. And look, Twilio to me is the quintessential company that can, can that should and, and can go public in this environment, right? It's a hundred plus million dollar revenue business, it's growing fifty plus percent a year, and it's not profitable today, but they have line of sight probably and when I say line of sight, couple quarters, right, where either from a cash perspective or on the net income perspective, they can be profitable. Like that's an attractive business, and I think businesses with those characteristics can go out. Um, what we don't have in the IPO market today, which is what I think we're all waiting for probably, this is a guess, second half of 2017, first half of 18, is we don't have one of these real big marquee names who's ready to go today, right? So you know, we don't have an Uber, or we don't have an Airbnb, or we don't have a Pinterest or a Snapchat that is like saying, okay, I'm gonna go today. And so I think the market, you know, modulo, you know, Brexit or Putin, you know, finding more emails, whatever the case may be. Um, you know, modulo some like macro event that like uh, we just can't forecast. I think it's a fine market, but I think the volume of deals will be, you know, relatively muted as it's been until we get to hopefully some of those marquee names deciding, which my guess is probably at least 12 months away, and that's just pure speculation based on, you know, no real facts. Um, uh, until we get one of those names, and if one of those comes out and they and they do well, then I think you know you really truly reopen the IPO window in a substantive way where you can have a lot more companies. Look, I think what happened in the IPO window, which happens all the time, is you know it kind of opened up in 2000, you know 11, 2012 for earnest in earnest, and you know we had a good run with some good years, right? We had kind of 50 IPOs a year, which is actually what the historical median is over the last 35 years. And then what often happens is as we get later in the cycle you know, the, the quality of the issuers, you know, does change. And if you look at this just factually, without, again, making any normative statements about the companies, the revenue growth uh, has slowed in terms of, if you look at the class of IPOs that happened in 2012, 13, 14 versus 2015, you know, the class of 15 had slower revenue growth than those 
and had larger operating losses than the 2012 to the forward. So again, just factually, we got to a point in the cycle where companies that didn't have the same financial characteristics were going out. And naturally, the investors said, hold on, like that's not what we bargained for. And so the market kind of closed down. And I think, again, now we're getting to the point where people say, hey, a company like Twilio, that's a good company. And we like those financial characteristics. And so uh, I think it's a very open market for those businesses. It's just a question of when that marquee name comes out that really hopefully opens the next real wave of IPOs. Questions from the audience. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Scott. Hi, Hi Roger. Hi. So I had a question about um, what's your perspective on founders who start companies where they happen to be the end user or the originating customer, they're actually solving their own pain point that they experience? What's your point of view on that? And secondary, what's your point of view on Paul Graham's article on you know do things that don't scale initially? Um, so on the first point, uh, I don't know. I don't know that I have a perspective on it other than look. I think that's perfectly fine, right? I mean, if you're if you're the only customer and you're solving your problem, then obviously that's a problem for all of us. Um, Hopefully you're happy. Right. But uh, but look, to me, that's that's kind of goes to the point I talked about earlier, which it goes to the organic nature of stuff, right? Which is, look, if you felt so compelled, this problem was so important, it had to be solved, and hopefully there's a universe of more than one who actually has this problem, like, I think that's great. Like, I'd much rather back you in that problem than someone who kind of read about it in a book and decided that that was an important problem. So. Uh, uh, I have no problem there. Um, I have to admit, uh, as much as I try to read, I did not read the Paul Graham thing, so uh, rather than me speculating, I will read it, and then um, if I have something interesting to say on it, I'll, uh, I'll tweet it out so I can give you a more informed voice. Yeah. Mike, anything um, um, from the community? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Well, um, uh, sorry, we've oh, got okay. a... Oh. Uh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll ask a technology question. Okay. Uh -oh. uh, everybody knows the most recent technology we have is the internet, which is uh, invented by uh, Tim Berners-Lee in yeah. uh, English. Uh, domestically, in the United States here, we don't have any significant technology for 40 years. As what I know, I found four patents in 1999, but uh, for the past 18 years, I'm sitting in the audience seat. I got nothing. What I know is uh, we have 7 million illegal immigrants in uh, California, 20 million nationwide. These people cannot write, cannot read, and the more and the more coming. This is what I know, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you know, but I know. Uh, my question is, uh, will you invest uh, to technology or you prefer invest to this uh, illegal immigrant? I'm not, I'm not sure I caught the last part of the question. I apologize, can you repeat that? Uh, I suppose most of this is invested technology, but it seems to me you are not interested in technology. You are more interested in investing in that. Those people, 20 million might be more, who couldn't read and write. So are you asking, am I, am I interested what's, in? What's your preference? What's your preference? You invest technology or you invest in others? Uh, OK, I'm, I'm not 100% sure I understood the question, but look. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, we we absolutely look. We want to invest in, in we absolutely want to invest in technology. Period. Right now, I'm sorry. Are you talking about me or are you talking about the U.S.? I'm not sure what. Oh, oh, look. Okay, yeah. This is a, this is a much bigger political yeah, topic. Yeah, look. Let's, let's try. Let, and get let a me give. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a very big political topic. Look, I would agree with the general statement, which is look. I think. The U.S. investment in basic R&D is well below where it needs to be. I 100% agree with that. This is a, but this is a much longer discussion that probably, uh, yeah, we should yeah, take offline. Yeah, I think offline. let's try and you know keep this <laughs> more general. Uh, you know, I really want yeah. you folks to get your questions yeah. answered in terms of helping you um, really with your own startup. Yeah. Uh, but Mike, let's just take one question from the virtual audience. Yeah. Okay. This is a simple one. I hope. Um, <laughs> Andreessen is very assuming. Andreessen is very bullish on drone technologies. Yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts on drone startups? Yeah, so we have a we have a number of investments in drones. We have a company called Airware, which is doing kind of, you know, commercial application of drones. We have a uh, actually we made an investment in a company called SkySafe, which is the the anti-drone company. Which is now that we have drones, right? We need actually security around. <laughs> that. So SkySafe's a very it's a it's a seed stage company, but the basic <laughs> idea is you know. How do we make sure that you know drones don't actually fly into live airfields and things of that sort? Um, so look, we're very, very, uh, we're very interested in the area, um, particularly the commercial applications for it, right? So like what Airware is doing is interesting stuff, like remote oil pipeline inspections or 
you know, um, you know, they literally uh, are helping insurance companies do inspections of roofs and taking pictures and stuff like that. Like, there's a lot of things where you know they're probably not very efficiently done today by right. humans. They're very costly. So yeah, we're we're very interested in the area and, and obviously happy to see anything that people are doing in that space. Great, thanks. Uh, another question from the audience. I know someone was waiting back here very patiently. Hello. Here. Okay. Right here. Okay. Oh, there. Okay. Gotcha. Okay, we got. <laughs> this lady here, 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 and then you. All right. Okay. Okay. So, I have a question. Okay. Um, we see Tesla, who has social responsibility at the core. So my question to you is: Is social, is corporate social responsibility important to you, and how can a company yeah. focus on improving lives? and improving themselves at the same, improving their business at the same time. Yeah, yeah, look, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very good point. Um, yeah, the question was about corporate social responsibility. So um, look, I think, it's, I think it's very important. Um, I think the question becomes, um, look, you have to re remember that, you know, for better or worse, and, and you know, we are, we, our job is to take money from large institutions like endowments and foundation and others, and they think of us as you know, our job is to earn a financial return on them. Those organizations themselves also tend to have lots of corporate social responsibility, uh, you know, kind of agendas of their own as well. Um, so what's hard for us as a venture capital firm is to make a judgment where we say, look, we, we will value one more over the other because of kind of, again, just the nature of our business, which is like our, our job is to, you know, maximize financial returns to a core set of investors. Now, there are venture capital firms, to be fair, who do mix the two, right? And so there are kind of social venture firms and others where they have a very specific agenda, and the investors who invest in those firms know exactly that, you know, they are not just solely focused on profit maximization, but they also are, are focused on a social agenda. So I think that's the probably right way to kind of run the business is be completely transparent with your investors as to what your objectives are and do it. And, and I do think a lot of these specialty venture capital firms um, actually have a really good audience, both of entrepreneurs they appeal to as well as a set of investors who want that dual mandate. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's important for all entrepreneurs, really, as you're, you're going down the funding road, to really, if you're a B Corp or you, um, mm -hmm. you know, have some uh, aspirations in terms of social responsibility, to look at social impact investors. And, you know, I think you're going to have a really tough time and get really despondent if you're going out to a lot of the sort of the Sand Hill, typical Sand Hill and Andreessen included, if you're saying, hey, we're going to be a B Corp and we want to be able to, you know, utilize certain of our profits to go in this direction. Uh, so I, I think it go comes down to fund fit and really understanding whether or not you actually would make a good fit for the fund yeah, because, yeah, yes, um, you know, you have an IRR that you have to, sure. you have yeah. to show. So we had a question here that we deferred, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, my question is, uh, what's your take on the startups that uh, have, let's say, two founders, uh, both of them are rooted somewhere um, yeah. beyond the US? Think yeah. of, uh, like me, I come, I come from Europe, my yeah. co-founder is from Europe, yeah. and we keep our engineering in Europe yeah. because yeah. we can get top talents there cheaper than here, yeah. uh, they don't jump or job every three months. Uh, <laughs> is, this, is, this, is this a problem for, for, the, for your company in particular, or it could be? Yeah, so, um, so let me just give you the numbers and then we can talk about the philosophy. So it is the case that, that the vast majority of our companies are based in the US. So if you looked at our portfolio, it's but probably, yeah, yeah. But look, the idea of, so, so that idea is fine. The issues that we, will, the questions that we will ask, right, are there's two there's two substantive issues that we would want to talk to you about, right? One is just, look, our ability to be helpful in those geographies is is just by definition much less, to be honest, right? All of our people are here, all of our you know networks and stuff are here, and so if it's important for you and for us to be able to kind of be valuable in those areas, we just got to be we have to be honest with each other. That, look, you know, particularly at a very early stage, like there's not a lot probably we can help you with in terms of you know helping you find engineers and you know, wherever, you're, wherever you have any base. Yeah, um, but, uh, and then the only second, to me, the only secondary substantive question that we should just talk about is, are you taking on any additional risk in terms of the integration of the company and the overall success of the company by starting with kind of bifurcated business, right? By having development potentially in one area and, you know, your product and marketing and other stuff. And there's no, there, uh, the honest answer is, look, there's no, there's no answer, there's no definitive answer to that, but we want to understand that. And so, you know, I'll just give you an example, certainly, Many venture capital firms here have kind of funded 
companies, particularly in Israel, right, where you do have R&D in Israel, and then you have the market-facing functions here. And so just because like, people have done that, like, everyone's comfortable with that, and I think most people get comfortable that as long as the, you know, the founding team understands those issues and can deal with it. So that, to me, is a substantive question. Now, again, the reality of our portfolio is most of it's here in part because you know, we don't spend a lot of time uh, you know, going on planes in Europe looking for stuff, not because it's not there, but just, it's just not our focus, just to be frank, right? Okay. I've got a question for you. Um, what are the three most important questions <laughs> that a, uh, an entrepreneur should, should ask a VC before taking their money? Uh, you know, I often tell my entrepreneurs to do diligence. It's VCs yeah. that we haven't done business with. We don't know to do diligence and to you know, call some of the CEOs of the, their yep. portfolio yep. companies. So are there any, you know, if you had to think about sort of the top three questions, obviously you want to make sure there's an alignment of interests yep. uh, in terms of sale of the company and you'll see that in drags. But um, anything in terms of what people should be asking the VCs? So I think, um, first of all, actually, I think the better thing is what you said first, which is, I mean, obviously ask the VCs, but probably you ought to go ask CEOs. You ought to go ask CEOs, right? Yeah. So like if you talk to a VC, you don't, first of all, you don't need their permission to call CEOs in their portfolio, so you know, that's probably, you, know, you shouldn't ask for permission. But like, if you ask that and they're even hesitant to offer that or they think it's you know, imposition or not necessary, then I think you should just go somewhere else, right? Yeah. Independent of who the VC is, right? Because you know, the best people who will tell you the truth is people who actually have to live with those VCs day by day. Um, so I think, you gotta, I think you should absolutely do that as part of your diligence for sure. You know, I don't know if there's any other specific questions to ask uh, other than around those fundamental issues we talked about, which is, do you actually have an alignment of interest, right? Like, am I, as the founder, optimizing for the same things that you think we ought to be optimizing for? And, you know, if, the, if we really have philosophical differences on those things, again, probably, like, we're not, we're not going to be, we're not good partners together. And when you're talking about that kind of optimization, are you talking about in terms of direction, in terms of product? Yeah, less, or? less so about product, because, look, again, you shouldn't take product advice from us, yeah. um, right? Like, you know, you know the product a thousand times better than you. I would say more about what are you trying to build, right? So, like... Is, is your goal, are you doing this because you think this is your life's mission and like you absolutely think that, you know, kind of what you want to do is build some enduring, you know, company, you know, that can, you know, last for the next 30, 40, 50 years or something like that? Or are you trying to say, or do you think this is kind of, hey, I want to do this for a couple of years and then, you know, I really want to go exit to a, Quick you know, to, to a company, right? And again, yeah. that may be a fine financial outcome, but I think you're just setting yourself up for kind of, you know, asymmetric, you know, kind of objectives at that point in time. Um, and then look, the only other thing that I would really spend time on the diligence side is really, is, is the GP as excited about the opportunity as you are, right? Because again, what you're expecting from that GP is they're making a, you know, I don't know, seven, eight, 10, 12 year commitment to you. And that doesn't mean necessarily that, look, you know, that they're signing up to fund you no matter what you do for the next 12 years, but they are signing up to make a big commitment. And, you know, it's a big deal for somebody to come off the board, right? So it's not, you know, you should feel the same conviction from the GP as you do for your business. And, you know, they, they should, you should feel like, you know, they want to go spend, you know, the next 10 years of their life being a partner in this business. Okay. One question I've got to get in because uh -oh. I get it all the time. Okay. I know there's no answer, so, you know, I'm giving you that out up front, uh, but it relates <laughs> to traction. You know, yep. what is traction, and obviously it's different between, you know, in a, in a B2B and a B2C play, but um, can you give the, 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 you know, the entrepreneurs here some, some guidance? I mean, even if you can't tell us, you know, what is traction, maybe you can tell us what isn't traction. Because, you know, you'll get the comments coming back, it's too early, yep. not yep. enough traction. Yep. You know, you kind of think you're <laughs> at the seed stage, you think you're at the A stage, and you kind of get this. So from yeah. your, your point of view, what do you, what do you think? So it's, it's really, it is really hard to answer, and I'm not trying to be evasive, um, because in many cases it actually may vary based upon company. So I'll just give you, like, for example, for us sometimes, look, if we are funding a consumer, primarily consumer-facing business where, you know, things like monthly active users or, you know, what your, uh, what your cohort attrition curves look like and stuff like that, um, it is often the case that we may say, hey, look, you know, unless we, you know, we really have like incredible conviction and we just, you know, we see it as beautifully as you do, we may say, look, like we're not ready to seed that company at the seed stage, to fund at seed stage until we start to be able to do some diligence on those things. And part of that is the nature of, look, some of these consumer things, they are like catching lightning in a bottle, right? And, um, you know, uh, and so, you know, this is again, a very crass generalization, but there may be cases where it may, you may be more comfortable passing up that seed stage and waiting for the, more, for the, the data, even though you know that's going to cost you more money, right? It's going to, the valuation is going to be higher at that point in time, just because there's nothing that you can really kind of 
get your head around from a diligence perspective, right? And again, you know, sometimes you just make the bet blindly on the team. You say, look, it doesn't matter. Like, I know this team is the right team, and you know, they're going to figure it out. But, but that's traction in that case means something. Traction to me in the more enterprise-facing context um, is, um, I think that's a that's I think there's probably in our case at least a lesser requirement for that at those seed stages because by definition you're not going to have traction right because mm -hmm. you're building a product. So um, I think probably if you're an enterprise-facing company and a VC tells you that they're passing because of lack of traction at the seed stage, well, yeah. that's probably a euphemistic way for saying you know they they were trying to be polite probably, uh, but. Um, uh, and, and maybe that's a, maybe that's better than saying we just really don't like you as a founder or something. But uh, um. so so in that in that situation, you know, having a you know a letter from a, a customer that says, hey, you know, basically you build it, we'll buy it. Yeah, look, I think I that's mean, great. I think that's know. super helpful, right? Yeah. So yeah, look, anything you can do, any evidence you can do to solve the traction thing is great, right? Because it also goes to the market size, it goes to the market need problem. Uh, but I also think in general, um, probably most VCs, at, you know, if you're funding an enterprise company. They'll they'll kind of make that assessment on their own right at the seed stage. They may say, okay, look, I know there's five customers that I could go talk to and I could describe what this person is doing and get a sense from them. So yeah, look, if you can shortcut that problem for us, yeah. by all means, that's great. But um, uh, Steve Goldberg uh, a couple of months ago, he was our guest and he said he's looking for companies whose customers are bleeding from the neck. Yeah, yeah. So you know when yeah. he. Uh, you know, when he does those well, I think calls, that's right, yeah. You know. so we, we use, uh, again, we use the term internally, is it an aspirin or a vitamin, right? So again, yeah. like, you know, look, vitamins are great, and, you know, but probably if you miss your vitamin, you know, you're probably going to survive the next day, right? Whereas if you've got a splitting headache, right, you need the aspirin. So, yeah, so I, I think that's right. That's the kind of, that's what you want is, are you solving an aspirin problem? Is, is your solution an aspirin to the problem as opposed to just a vitamin? But I think, I think you know, I think you can get that through, even if the company doesn't have technical traction at that point in time, I think, you know, VCs ought to be able to assess that from an enterprise customer perspective. Just for your entrepreneurs, uh, I had somebody in my office yesterday. I just want to make sure that when you use jargon, and especially for really sophisticated VCs, you really need to understand the meaning, because uh, you were talking about the product never kind of ends up, you know, right. where. It, and he said, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and then in six months' time, I'm going to pivot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well. That's good. That's, okay. that's incredible. That's incredible foresight. To yeah, know you know, maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe you should just go there right, right away. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 That would be good. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Um, so yeah, I really understand the jargon. Yeah, everybody wants to, to talk yeah. it, but understand it. Yeah. Um, question right here. Thank you very much for a very yes. informative and thoughtful presentation. Oh, thanks. Um, you used analogy of marriage to describe relationship between company entrepreneurs and investors. You also mentioned a high uh, percentage of divorces. <laughs> if relationship between portfolio company and partner that represents a 16 doesn't work out, what do you do? Do you go for full divorce? Do you substitute partner? Do you take over company? Well, no, look, we, we absolutely will never take over the company because, look, we're, you know, if, if we get to that point in time, then probably the right answer is, look, we should have a discussion and say, look, this, this you know, the company, if the company's not working, Look, we're not we're not in the turnaround business, right? The probably reality is, look, we need to go find a home for it. Either hopefully there's an acquirer or something, or or maybe the answer is we have to wind it down, right? But um, so look, um, uh, there ought not to be divorces between general partners and and uh, entrepreneurs. Now, now there are things that sometimes happen. Just to, again, to be completely frank, where there are companies where over time, you know, you as the founder CEO, you, you know, you maybe you're maybe you're not scaling into that CEO job, right? And and you know that happens sometimes, unfortunately, and so the board as a whole might have to actually make a decision to say, okay, look, we need somebody else as the CEO of the company. Now, that's obviously you know, a major, major you know, uh, place to get to, but, but that certainly could happen. Um, we haven't had an instance yet, and we're just we're only seven years old, where somebody's come back to us after a couple of years and said, hey, this general partner really stinks. Can you give me a different one? I would like to think that we would do that, right? I don't think there's any, there's no great, uh, there's no great value in us saying, sorry, like you're married, like you know, we don't recognize divorces in this you know, community. Um, but you know, like that would be. I, I think that there was, there's probably something more fundamental going on if that's the case. Um, you know, unless the guy just turns out to be a real jerk or something. But like that just. So yes, I, I we haven't had there yet. But I, I'm pretty confident if we got to that point and the company was still, you know, doing what it's supposed to be doing, and we there literally was just a personality mismatch. Yeah, I think we'd do the right thing. Mike, you have one last question from yeah. the virtual audience. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> It's just kind of a fun one. What are the most, or is the most unusual or unique pitch you've heard in, let's say, the last year? 
Uh, that's that's really Even, specific. Yeah, you know, I always, I, I always get this question. I wish I had a better answer for it. Um, you know, uh, look, the very honest answer, which will sound stupid, is like the diversity of things we see and the, and the kinds of things we see are amazing. And sometimes you walk out, you know, sometimes I'll go home. On, we have a lot of our pitches on Mondays and Thursdays. Sometimes I'll go home and I'll, you know, talk to my daughters or something and say, hey, look, here's what we saw today. And, you know, we might see a artificial intelligence, you know, cancer therapeutic company at the same time we see a social network, at the same time we see somebody trying to put... Uh, you know, satellites up in the sky to do you know video imaging or something. So I, I don't know that I, I don't know that I have anything that's weird, uh, other than like um, we are continually impressed with the creativity and the like intellectual capacity of the people that we see come through our door. And you know, things that are weird actually might turn out to be the best investments because you know they're off the beaten path. Sorry, I wish I had a better answer for you. <laughs> What do you suggest? Are there any, what kind of job opportunities yeah, are there? Yeah, and yeah. What, what is the path uh, you may suggest to the uh, candidates in that flow? Yeah, okay, so if you really want, so let me give you some numbers, and, and this is not to be depressing, but uh, I just wanna kinda give you a perspective. So we live in a bubble, and I don't mean a valuation bubble, we live in a kind of a hermetically sealed bubble around here where you know, for better or worse, and because of shows like Silicon Valley probably, uh, <laughs> like this industry looks way bigger than it actually is. The reality of this business is these numbers are rough order of magnitude. There's probably 300 or 400 active venture capital firms, right? You know, on average, they might have four to five or six general partners or something. So when you kind of add up the jobs, there's probably, I don't know if my math is right, but you know, you're probably talking about, you know, maybe 8,000, 10,000 jobs or something. I don't know if, if that math is even right, or maybe it's less than that, whatever. Uh, I'm not very good at math on the fly. But uh, I say that only to say, look, it is, it is a really tiny industry, and so, um, I think to have, I think it's dangerous to say, uh, like, my career goal, my only career goal in life is to be a venture capitalist just because the reality is, like, there just aren't that many jobs that open up over time. Um, I think the best thing you can do to become a venture capitalist, if that's part of your career path, is to be in the startup community, right? At least from our perspective, the most valuable thing that will make you successful as a venture capitalist is, you know, have you actually been through the company building process in a way where you can be valuable to somebody else who's going through that process? Um, you know, the other obviously skill set is look, you have to have some depth of product. You know, at least if you're if you're at our firm and doing kind of more software-based stuff, right? You have to have enough of a depth of product knowledge to be able to kind of distinguish between, you know, the ten storage companies that came in today that, quite frankly, all look the same when you look at their marketing materials, but like. You have to be able to, to distinguish between those things. But I think from a just career perspective, I talk to a lot of uh, you know, students who come out of school who understandably want to be venture capitalists because you know, for better or worse, it seems like an incredibly sexy job to do. Um, but you, know, um, you just have to, I think, be realistic about number one, just the number of jobs. But, but two is the best thing to do to improve your lot as to be a venture capitalist, I think, is to be in the startup uh, community, right? And you know, Sometimes late way leads on the way, and sometimes you're like me, and you get lucky, and you get introduced to somebody. And look, I didn't know I I, I didn't know I would be a venture capitalist in 2009 when I get introduced to Mark Andreessen in 1999. But you know, it just a lot of happenstance happens. But I think the skill set you can develop is being part of the company building process that would be attractive. And then you just gotta you know build relationships and network and do all the things, of course, that you ought to do as an entrepreneur, anyways. And you know, hopefully, the circuitous path ultimately gets you there. Sorry, I don't want to mean to end on a depressing note, but... Well, I'll, I'll try and rectify that. Uh, so obviously, big data, machine learning, IoT, and wearables are, are hot topics. Are there any kind of uh, sleeper opportunities that you guys are keeping an eye open for? I don't know if it's a sleeper opportunity, uh, but I think it's kind of basic bread and butter, which is, I, I think, the changes that are happening in the core enterprise are, I, I think, I still think are just underestimated, right? And so when I think about every stack of the enterprise, if you're networking or your storage or you are, you know, even in, you know, virtualization layers or core database layers, um, you know, our view is that, like, there are, th that we're at such the beginning of that happening. So I hate the word cloud because it's obviously incredibly overused, but just rough numbers, right? Four trillion dollars of spend, you know, uh, in general, you know, IT software and, and infrastructure, right, today. Two hundred billion dollars is the sum total of everything that's cloud today, right? So we're kind of 5% of the way there. And look, I don't know that all that four trillion goes away, right? Because like, you know, there's still gonna be things like servers and stuff like that. But I think that the opportunity over the next 10, 20, 30 years for that type of architectural change 
from a you know market size perspective is phenomenal, and, and we're barely, I think we're barely scratching the surface. So, you know, that's an area we're spending a lot of time on. We we did raise a small um, uh, life sciences kind of fund that's at the convergence of life sciences and computer science, which you know obviously is a, we think a really interesting area. So things like application of machine learning to you know, improve diagnostics for certain diseases and stuff like that. And so that's an area where we've kind of, you know, we have a small fund today, a uh, $200 million fund that we're working on, but we think is going to be a very, very big area over time. So there's Excellent. no shortage of opportunities. Excellent. Well, Scott, thank you so much for uh, well, thank you. spending the evening with us. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it.